Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to today's webinar, Containers as a Service. I am Nick Chase, and I would like to introduce you to today's panelist. We have Randy DeFau. Uh, Randy is with our product management team here at Marantis, and he uh, has been really working with all, uh, all of this stuff for some time, uh, and he's got a great background in defining what products are. So um, I really love to listen to, to him uh, explain how things work. And today he's going to tell us about containers as a service, how it works, uh, how to get it working for you. So uh, before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you've been to these webinars before, you will recognize uh, the pane on the right-hand side. Uh, you can go ahead and ask questions. We will be taking questions throughout. We will hold most of them towards uh, till till the end, but there may be some opportunities uh, within the webinar to uh, answer questions. So if you've got questions, go ahead and drop them in, and we will get to them as soon as we can. Uh, also, at the end of the webinar, you will get uh, a link to a copy of the slides, so you do not need to furiously write things down or screenshot everything as it goes by. So, um, without further ado, uh, Randy, tell us a little bit about what we're going to be hearing about today. Well, thanks, Nick. Uh, welcome, everyone. So, I've had Three cups of coffee today, but I'm still not as energetic as Nick, but I'll try to make sure it's an interesting webinar for everyone. Uh, so today what we're really going to explore is this movement in the industry towards using uh, containers uh, and Kubernetes as the container management platform as really uh, the next generation of application delivery uh, platforms, uh, particularly for those who are working in hybrid cloud areas. So we'll kind of explore this general move towards using Kubernetes, how it solves some application portability problems if you are working in a hybrid or multiple cloud environment. Then we'll uh, take a little bit of a look at how this actually works in practice with the containers as a service offering that Brantis has built. So we'll start with the developer workflow and then we'll uh, uh, pivot to look a little bit more at the operational experience. Uh, and then we'll uh, wrap up by taking a quick peek at some future work that Marantis is looking at uh, and explore some of the other trends that we see coming into the Kubernetes landscape over the next few months. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have a few minutes left uh, for Q&A. Uh, so that's, that's what we're uh, going to be covering. So again, as Nick said, please feel free to go ahead and put some questions into the chat window uh, as we go. So uh, first of all, let's start talking about Kubernetes on demand. So there's really a, a few trends in the industry right now that are converging and leading this movement towards offering containers as a service. Uh, and of course, we're focusing in this case, particularly on offering essentially Kubernetes as the container management platform as a service. So, you know, first of all, again, there's this trend towards using uh, hybrid cloud and hybrid cloud, depending on how you define it, it usually means a mixture of public and private cloud. But more generally, we just think of it as you've got at least two different types of cloud providers. So again, it could be on-premise OpenStack, uh, it could be public cloud providers like Amazon or Microsoft. And you know, depending on which analyst research you read, somewhere between 60 to 90 percent of, of large companies already have adopted this strategy for various reasons. Um, so this obviously poses some complexity to application developers. Uh, so if you're a developer, you're trying to deploy an application. Uh, you know, traditionally, it could be a little bit tricky to figure out how to easily deploy it onto multiple different types of infrastructure. So if you're deploying onto OpenStack, you might uh, start by using a heat template to provision your virtual resources. Uh, if you're on AWS, you would start probably with CloudFormation. Then you actually deploy the application and so on. So you really don't want to have to reinvent all of this plumbing every time you move to a different cloud platform. So, you know, one reason that uh, uh, containers as a service is becoming so popular and, you know, Gartner kind of thinks that containers as a service is in a few years going to be effectively replacing a lot of the legacy platform as a service offerings. You know, not only does it offer a lot of tremendous advantages, uh, Kubernetes is a great container management platform. It's, it's the de facto uh, container manager uh, adopted pretty much by all the major cloud providers and endorsed by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. 
but Kubernetes also gets you a little bit closer to that ideal of application portability. So, you know, one thing we'll talk about is the different layers of the technology stack you need to achieve something closer to true application portability. And having Kubernetes cluster deployed consistently on demand is, is certainly part of that. So, you know, as this slide says, there's really this complexity that we see in, in the landscape of hybrid clouds and trying to deploy applications consistently with high quality onto a lot of different target cloud platforms. And that's running smack dab into, you know, the need of the developers and the DevOps teams who want to be able to ship consistently and get their new innovations out the door uh, very rapidly. So with that bit of uh, introduction out of the way, we're going to take a quick break here to jump into our first poll. Okay, yes. So um, let me see. So we are going to, what we'd like to know here is, uh, where are you deploying Kubernetes now? Um, you should see that on your screen. Go ahead and um, go ahead and, and check off your answer and we will, see what you are doing. If you are not deploying Kubernetes yet, uh, go ahead and, and tell us in the chat, you know, what, why not? What are you, what are you thinking about doing? What's, uh, where are you right now? Where's your head right now? We'd like to kind of tailor this presentation to, uh, to where you all are. So, um, in terms of what we are getting back, we're seeing there's a lot of, uh, it's it's almost neck and neck between bare metal and OpenStack and private cloud, um, which is interesting. Um, so uh, what do you think about that, Randy? Well, that is really interesting, Nick. So you know, actually, one of the questions that somebody already popped into the window is I think related to this point. And they're asking, what's the difference between containers as a service and Kubernetes? So, you know, Kubernetes, again, is a container management platform, and it will run on, it was originally built to run on top of a cloud provider like AWS or OpenStack or Google Cloud, uh, but it can run very effectively on bare metal with uh, some functional uh, limitations and restrictions. But, you know, the difference with containers as a service, Kubernetes and bare metal, or in more generally Kubernetes that's owned by operators and effectively runs as a cloud in itself, that's a very different construct. There, it's more of a multi-tenant situation. You have a central team of operators who install what could be a quite large Kubernetes cluster. You know, some of the bare metal Kubernetes clusters I've seen are up to 300 nodes. And it, it's run like, uh, like an OpenStack cloud is. So, you know, it's multi-tenant, uh, people get access to run their workloads in Kubernetes, but they don't really own that cluster. It's owned by the operations team. Uh -huh. When we talk about containers as a service, it's a little bit of a different construct. Containers as a service means that you as a developer, as a part of a DevOps team, can go to uh, some interface and request a Kubernetes cluster on demand. So that's the as a service part of it. And in this context, almost always Kubernetes clusters on demand, containers as a service, is running on top of existing cloud infrastructure. So the operations team manages the infrastructure, which could be your AWS uh, account or your OpenStack cloud, but you can go into some interface and request a Kubernetes cluster on demand and have a provision for you. And from that point on, that Kubernetes cluster belongs to you and you can run your workloads on it and you know, basically do whatever you need to do. Gotcha. So actually, we should be calling this clusters as a service, <laughs> really. <laughs> well, we, we just don't like to invent too many new acronyms. No, 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 we don't want to do that. All right. So, uh, all right. So actually, the, the winner in this case, I shouldn't say winner, really, because it's pretty close. Uh, we've got OpenStack and private cloud followed by bare, by bare metal and then uh, AWS, a, a fairly distant third, and then other public cloud uh, taking up the rear. So, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close out this uh, poll, and uh, let's move on. Oh. Okay. Uh, wait, wait, yeah. wait, Randy, we don't have your screen. We Well, we have your I, desktop. Yeah, you made my screen go away when... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so when you switched over to the polls, and I have to go and get it back. There we go. Yeah. Bear with us for a moment, everyone. We, there we go. Okay. All right. Okay. So 
that's the general context we're operating in. You know, this uh, containers as a service uh, solves a need for developers who want to be able to rapidly deploy applications into a variety of different cloud environments with as little friction as possible. So again, there's a few different layers to the solution around that problem, but the containers as a service is really the foundational layer for the other things that come later on. So uh, now I'm going to switch over to talking a little bit about, you know, how that Mirantis is actually choosing to address this particular part of the problem. So Mirantis has, of course, our Mirantis cloud platform, and this is our uh, platform where we provide essentially uh, deployment lifecycle management and monitoring and operational tooling around a variety of open cloud software, including OpenStack, Kubernetes, and storage and networking providers as well. So in this context, again, if you think about uh, starting at the basic layer of you need infrastructure to run on. Uh, so if your infrastructure is private cloud, then Mirantis Cloud Platform or MCP can deploy uh, that bare metal infrastructure for you. So OpenStack, Kubernetes and bare metal, uh, SDN options and so on. Uh, the next layer up is really where we're gonna be focusing more of our attention on today. And that's really provisioning the cloud infrastructure resources that your applications need. And in this case, Kubernetes again is that foundational layer. So your workloads can run consistently no matter where, uh, you know, no matter which cloud infrastructure you happen to have Kubernetes running on. So we'll focus mostly on that layer today, and then I'll talk a little bit about at the end about what's coming next. So, you know, the, the third and fourth layers of this picture are really providing a service catalog, so providing the ability for your applications to consume things they need, like message queues or NoSQL databases, consistently, no matter which uh, cloud provider Kubernetes happens to be running on. And that's actually a, a, a very often it's an overlooked point when you talk about application portability. You know, it, it's one thing for your application to be able to run on, say, OpenStack and AWS, but if your application is built to consume DynamoDB as your NoSQL database, it's not portable. Uh, so the service catalog is that third uh, layer that we think about. And then the fourth layer is really complex uh, application orchestration. So how do you wire different components together? How do you optimize them for certain policies? And so that's the fourth layer, and we're starting to work in that area. I'll touch a little bit on that towards the end of the presentation. So this slide just gives a little bit of a, a pictorial recap of this MCP architecture. So we have the three boxes on the bottom are the you know, traditional MCP elements. So drivetrain is our name for our lifecycle management system. It provides the deployment, uh, lifecycle management, so day two operations, patching and upgrades for all the open cloud software that we manage. So on bare metal, of course, that can be OpenStack, Kubernetes, SDN, SDS, and so on. Uh, in this, uh, in the containers as a service context, that box you see on the top, uh, drivetrain under the hood is actually what's going to be deploying and managing Kubernetes consistently. And then the box on the right is Stacklight. This is our name for our OSS uh, operational support systems tooling. So this provides logging, monitoring, alerting, and some operational portals. So this was, uh, of course, originally built for the open cloud infrastructure software in the middle. Uh, we will in the future be extending this to cover the, uh, the Kubernetes and potentially Kubernetes workloads that we're running as part of this containers as a service offering. So the ultimate goal, again, is really to let a developer have a single consistent way to deploy a Kubernetes cluster wherever you need it, no matter if it's on private cloud, OpenStack, or public cloud. And right now we're supporting AWS, so we'll be adding support for Azure and uh, Google Cloud uh, in the future. So the basic idea is that uh, you know you, there's a lot of ways to deploy Kubernetes right now, and one of the problems is some of those ways are complex. So if you use uh, cargo or cube spray, you've got to learn Ansible and you've got to you know, learn how the Ansible model works in terms of group variables and host variables and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of other tools. You know, you can go to some public cloud providers and they have their own way to deploy Kubernetes that works really well on their platform and doesn't work at all anywhere else. So our goal here is to provide you a simple way and give you the same Kubernetes cluster with the same capabilities, uh, no matter what the underlying infrastructure is. So now let's take a look at how this actually works for uh, for developers. So you're a consumer of Kubernetes, you'd like to have a Kubernetes cluster that you can deploy and use to run your workloads on. So again, without some kind of containers as a service offering, uh, 
you say you want to deploy a containerized app. So first of all, if you've got a variety of cloud infrastructure to choose from, you have to decide, well, which, which cloud should I run it on, OpenStack or AWS? Then you decide, well, which container management platform do I want? Uh, so we'll assume you've chosen Kubernetes. Uh, then you choose the installer. And again, there's about 17 different ways to install Kubernetes. You know, a handful of those are really high quality. Uh, but again, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not always an easy question to answer. Then you deploy your Kubernetes cluster, and then you standardize it. So you have to make sure you've got Prometheus installed for monitoring. Uh, you may want to deploy a log collection framework. You can use Helm as part of your application catalog. You need to install Helm. So uh, there's a lot of things to consider here, and we want to wipe away all of this complexity. So with containers as a service, uh, you want to deploy a containerized application. Uh, you still have to decide which cloud you want to run on. And that's actually kind of an interesting question that I'll revisit a little bit later at the end. And you essentially go to the portal or the API that we provide and you hit deploy. And that's all you have to do. So, you know, we provide all those choices that I mentioned in the last slide, you know, which how do you monitor it, uh, you know, which add-ons do you install? You don't have to worry about that anymore. So we make some choices for you out of the box. Uh, so for example, we will go ahead and install Helm as part of the Kubernetes clusters we deploy. Uh, and you know, as the operator of this system, if you have other choices you want to make, or if you want to inject your own uh, Kubernetes network policies by default, then you do it once, and everybody who uses the containers as a service framework after that those choices are made for them, and so you, again, take away a lot of the, the complexity from the individual users. So in a little bit more detail, what actually happens, uh, right now we have a, a web-based portal. Uh, we have a, an initial version out now. We're revamping it to add some additional details about all the clusters you deploy and add some basic monitoring capabilities. But the idea is you go into this portal, you choose uh, which underlying cloud infrastructure you want to run on. You provide your access credentials for that cloud, and you hit go. And then uh, our containers as a service platform deploys Kubernetes, gives you an update on the progress of the deployment. So depending on which cloud platform you're deploying on, it can take anywhere from a minute up to about uh, 10 minutes or so to, to provision the Kubernetes cluster. And in return, what you get are the access credentials. So you get the IP address or the domain name of the, uh, the Kubernetes API endpoint, and you get a cube config file already provided for you, so you can just start using cube control and uh, and get going. So these are a couple of screenshots, again, a little bit more detail on, on what that uh, user experience actually looks like. So again, right now, it's very, very simple. Uh, for the first iteration, we wanted to make this as simple as possible. So you give your cluster a name, you choose the target cloud provider, provide your credentials, and provide the cluster size and that's really all the information you have to provide. Now, of course, there may be cases in the future where there's some additional choices that would make sense here. So for example, on Bare Metal, we support two different CNI plugins for Kubernetes. We support Calico and Open Contrail. For containers as a service, we're only offering Calico right now because for the vast majority of workloads, especially when you have a small Kubernetes cluster running on top of another cloud, Calico makes a lot of sense and it, it works very, very well. Uh, but if, you know, if there are cases in the future where open contrail might make sense, then it would be very easy for us to offer that up as an option here. When the cluster is available, again, you get this type of information back. Uh, you get the IP address of the Kubernetes master API endpoint. You can download the kube config file so you can start using all your Kubernetes client software. Uh, and you get information about all the nodes that are part of this cluster. Uh, so by default, we deploy, uh, you know, in this case, three master nodes, and then we have two worker nodes. Uh, and of course, this, the size of the cluster is configurable, and you can scale the cluster up or down later on uh, based on your needs. It is important to note here, though, that you know that the general idea here is that these clusters can be long-lived, but the idea is you can tear down and recreate clusters whenever you need to do. Uh, so if you have maybe one production cluster that's long-lived, and you can scale it up or down based on demand. But for development and test purposes, you, know, you could easily integrate this service into your Jenkins pipelines. So if you wanted to spin up a brand new Kubernetes cluster whenever you needed to run integration testing, you could certainly do that. So you don't have to worry about uh, repurposing existing Kubernetes clusters for those type of uh, ephemeral workloads. 
So that's what it looks like as a consumer of the service. Now, let's uh, take a, a little bit of a step back and talk more about the operational concerns around Kubernetes. So, you know, certainly if you're uh, part of the, the team that's managing Kubernetes and bare metal, there's a lot of important planning you have to do. Uh, but even as a consumer of Kubernetes, if you are running production workloads, there are some considerations to keep in mind here. So Marantis has adopted this set of core principles as you move to adopt container workloads. So, you know, I'll go through each of these, but these are the outlines. So adopting the best container framework, making that framework stable and easy to operate, uh, making sure that that uh, framework works well, uh, no matter what size the workloads are, so any scale of deployment. Um, and then a little bit more advanced topics, talking about deploying in different regions on top of different cloud infrastructure, and then uh, providing some connectivity between container workloads and other types of workloads. So let's jump into these principles, and I'll kind of explain their, their relevance to the containers of the service offering. So first of all, of course, as a container management framework, you know, a year ago, I think this question would have been a little bit more interesting. There was kind of an active debate about you know, Kubernetes versus Docker Swarm versus Mesos, and we evaluated all of those. But really, it ended up being a fairly simple choice for us. So Kubernetes is rapidly becoming the standard now. It's backed by Google, Intel, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, AWS, Microsoft, all the major cloud providers have decided to support Kubernetes. So and, and I would actually like to just—I would actually just like to inter, interject here for a minute. Just this morning, Docker Enterprise announced that they were going to support it. <laughs> so <laughs> well, thanks, Nick. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. So it really seems like you know even uh, Mesos, for example, they offer a very good underlying uh, uh, cloud management system. And Mesos has a really interesting resource scheduler, kind of a two-phase scheduler, which makes it really efficient uh, and scalable for certain types of workloads. But as the actual container management interface, you know, Mesos has started to adopt Kubernetes as well. So it, it's very definitely a, an ongoing trend. So we, you know, we decided that Kubernetes is what will support and offer. Now, in terms of the, you know, making this a, a stable uh, platform and easy to manage and operate. So we do provide our own Kubernetes distribution. Uh, so we make some choices for that distribution, like the choice of CNI and, and storage and things like that. Uh, you know, we scale test our Kubernetes distribution up to 500 nodes. We perform longevity testing and, and so on. So we really focus on giving you a stable, consistent uh, Kubernetes uh, distribution that works well, whether it's on bare metal or on different types of cloud infrastructure. And again, when you're talking about different types of clouds, we've worked hard to make sure that you have the same feature compatibility on those different cloud platforms. So for example, on OpenStack, we've worked to make sure that we have load balancers and DNS and these types of add-on services that Kubernetes expects from the underlying cloud infrastructure, they work well. Uh, we're also focusing a little bit more on the operational experience in terms of monitoring. Uh, so MCB is designed to let you manage multiple clouds from a single set of tooling, uh, stack light and drivetrain. Uh, and in the containers as a service world, you know, we're still working to adapt all of our tooling to that framework. Uh, but the idea here is that if you're a, a developer and you have 10 different Kubernetes clusters you're using, you get a single pane of glass to see what's going on there. And uh, the first iteration of that will be coming out very soon. We do have a revamped containers as a service portal that's almost complete. And it does include some basic uh, monitoring and, and metrics about all the Kubernetes clusters that you've deployed. Now, scalability, this is, is probably more relevant for bare metal Kubernetes clusters. Uh, again, some of these clusters can run into many hundreds of nodes. So we do scale testing there. What's probably more relevant for containers as a service is we do also focus on the networking capabilities of Kubernetes because we have customers that are running some uh, some advanced uh, virtual network function type of workloads on top of Kubernetes. So this isn't necessarily about scalability in terms of size of the cluster. It's really more about performance uh, on the networking side. So Calico, again, is a great choice for the vast majority of workloads. Open Contrail tends to be really good for some of the more advanced uh, network function virtualization type of scenarios. So just as an example, uh, we're helping one customer now who needs multicast support in Kubernetes for uh, a video streaming type of application. Uh, that's not really supported natively in Kubernetes, so we're working to provide 
uh, the ability to use multiple CNI options as part of a single cluster, the idea being that they can use Calico or Open Contrail for the normal pod networking uh, and then tap into, use SRIOV to tap into uh, the provider network to provide the multicast. Okay, now uh, in terms of uh, multi-region deployments, I think this is a, a very interesting topic. So, uh, you know, Kubernetes has uh, a federation capability right now, and that gives you the ability to have a single endpoint that you can use to deploy uh, your workload into two or more independent Kubernetes clusters. So, in the context of containers as a service, what this means is that you can have, say, a Kubernetes cluster running on premise on OpenStack and one running in public cloud in AWS. And with a single API endpoint, you could actually deploy a, a workload into both of those cloud providers at the same time. And this can be used for load balancing, or maybe you have one as you know a backup site or whatever the case may be. Uh, and you know, as part of this, we've also worked to resolve some service accessibility issues. So this is really more of the case on bare metal, uh, where you don't have an underlying cloud provider, but we have worked to integrate Kubernetes with external DNS providers and load balancers. So if nothing else, you know, on bare metal, you can have your service registered uh, through your, uh, some DNS service for accessibility. Uh, but in the context of federation, uh, federation usually uses core DNS, so you have a single DNS endpoint, and uh, depending on where you're connecting from, you can choose to go into different uh, Kubernetes clusters. And of course, multi-cloud deployments, this is really what containers as a service is all about. Uh, based on you know, where your workload happens to run best, you get a choice of where to deploy that Kubernetes cluster. So, you know, again, our focus is on giving you a stable and easy to operate Kubernetes distribution that works wherever you need it to work. Uh, and that, again, helps you to achieve some of that application portability. Uh, so if you have uh, an application uh, that you've traditionally developed and run on OpenStack and you need burst out capability to AWS, if you've developed in the Kubernetes framework uh, or even using Helm charts, then you, with containers as a service, you know that you can easily deploy the same type of Kubernetes cluster on different cloud infrastructure and move your workload around based on whatever policies you have. So now before we jump into the next section, I think it's time for our next poll. Yes, it is. Okay, so um, now that we kind of have a feel for what uh, Kubernetes and containers as a service this is good for let's find out how people are actually deploying kubernetes this is uh, this is one of my personal bugaboos right now <laughs> so i'm going to go ahead and uh ask you all uh how are you deploying kubernetes are you using you know kubatom or are you using cargo uh, well it used to be called cargo now it's it's kube spray are you just using a hosted solution on your public cloud um if you are saying other, and there do seem to be a few people saying other, tell us in the chat what that other is, because um, we're we're interested to hear how people are getting their hands on Kubernetes. So um, let us know that. What is uh, what? I mean, well, I was going to say, what is your favorite way of doing it? Uh, but <laughs> I mean, obviously, your way of doing it is MCP. So that was, that was a silly question on my part. Yeah, no, it, it's interesting. This, this has actually changed for me. Uh, I, I used to use Cargo pretty heavily because uh, even though it was a little bit, there was a little bit of a learning curve, it was kind of a, a little bit of a complex system, uh, it was very portable. So it was, it was based on Ansible, it had a very well designed uh, framework underneath it. Uh, so for the type of work I do where I set up a lot of Kubernetes clusters for you know demos and testing purposes, it was really easy once I got the hang of it to have it scripted and very automated. So yeah, I could deploy a cluster on VMs on my laptop, or I could deploy a cluster on you know, Mirantis's internal cloud. Uh, so that, that was what I traditionally used to use. I started actually switching over to use KubeADM, which is also very scriptable. Uh, and KubeADM is interesting because this is, I think, the first time that the, the Kubernetes community has really decided to focus on a standard way to deploy Kubernetes. Uh, it isn't quite there yet. Uh, you no, know, for example, out of the box, not. Kube, yeah, Cube ADM doesn't offer high availability for the master tier and all these things, but it's it's progressing pretty rapidly. So, I mean, one in the context of containers as a service, one thing we're keeping an eye on 
you know, right now under the hood, our drive chain system is, is actually deploying these Kubernetes clusters. So, for example, on AWS, it uses CloudFormation to provision uh, some VMs on AWS, and then we have some, uh, you know, we use Salt uh, to actually deploy the Kubernetes services and things like that. Uh, one thing we're looking at for the future is whether it'll start to make sense for us to incorporate KubeADM as part of that framework. Now, you know, KubeADM, again, doesn't, isn't functionally equivalent in terms of lifecycle management and all those things, but we could certainly use it for some of the initial bootstrapping. So that's something we'll definitely be keeping an eye on in the future. Another thing we don't have listed here is Spinnaker, which is a, a workflow, a great workflow tool that I know that we're also working on um, using for deploying uh, deploying Kubernetes clusters, and then also, you know, lets you manage the life cycle of the cluster that you have deployed, which is interesting. I, I saw a demo yesterday. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, well, it, Spinnaker uh, is actually a little bit of a different animal. Uh, Spinnaker oh, yeah. is great because it will deploy, it, it's optimized for uh, de deploying cloud native workloads onto different cloud environments. So it started out as a way to bake source code into an AMI or some other type of image and deploy it onto you know, AWS or some other cloud. Uh, it does work with Kubernetes. It, it doesn't actually normally deploy Kubernetes, though. You configure it to integrate into uh, an existing Kubernetes cluster. Uh, right. And then you it'll can... deploy your workload as a Kubernetes service and set up load balancers and things like that. Right. You can, but you can create a workflow. Anyway, it was very interesting yep. what I saw. It was, it was, um, it was Spinnaker deploying Kubernetes with Spinnaker so that you could deploy Kubernetes. It was very bizarre, but it was <laughs> very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. all right. So uh, KubeADM does seem to be very popular. We have quite a few uh, others, which is our, our second place answer. Um, some people are saying Ansible is, is their other. Um, we don't have a lot of other feedback on what other is in this case. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to close out this poll. So get ready to share your screen again, Randy. Okay. <laughs> so here we go. All right, there we are. All right, wonderful. Okay. So moving so, right along. Uh, yeah, moving ahead. So let, let's kind of recap. I've talked a lot about application portability, and now I want to uh, circle back to this topic a little bit. So, you know, if you look at this evolution of, of where we've come at, as a software industry over the past 20 years or so, of course, we started with you know, everything. We had servers, we ran our own data centers. We, you know, then the virtualization wave hit. Uh, you know, and that that solved a lot of challenges. Uh, and of course, along with that was the rise of infrastructure as a service. So running VMs on top of hardware that somebody else owns, whether it's your own operations team running OpenStack or a public cloud provider. Uh, then we moved, but again. You know, VMs are notoriously not easy to port from one type of cloud provider to another for various reasons. So, you know, I've helped people migrate from VMware to OpenStack, and that can be challenging because the way the VM was constructed, uh, it has certain expectations that aren't always, uh, you know, easy to, to shift from one cloud to another. Uh, and some of that, again, is, you know, things like dependency management. So then we moved from VMs to containers, and that is, I think, moving from probably from the, hey, kicking the tires, it so looks really cool to us. Let's do it for real. I see a lot of customers this year starting to really make an investment in running container uh, workloads in production. So that solved uh, another set of challenges for application developers. You didn't have to worry about, hey, uh, does the VM my app's running on? You know, is it built with the right set of things inside? We just have all that in our container image. Uh, uh, and, you know, there's some overlap between the idea of having a VM image like an AMI or a glance image. That can have a lot of things baked into it as well. But it was just a little bit uh, more cumbersome than working with a like a Docker container image. So containers solved another set of problems, but you know containers by themselves are you know rarely useful in isolation. So they're part of a bigger ecosystem. And so Kubernetes came around with some constructs to help you declare that hey, there's a certain set of containers that are always deployed together. Uh, there's a set of containers that constitute a service, and we're going to expose that service through a port or a load balancer. Uh, so Kubernetes solves some of those types of problems. Relationships between containers, how services are visible to other things inside the cluster or outside the cluster, uh, and then making services more portable. And now Helm is something I mentioned briefly. Helm, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, started out really as a package manager type of concept for Kubernetes. So Helm has the idea of a chart 
which will allow you to define, say, several Kubernetes services that form an application. So it's another step up that logical chain of, uh, of ideas. So for example, if you're deploying Spark, uh, you can have a Spark master uh, as running as a Kubernetes service that might be highly available. Uh, and then you can have another Kubernetes service that has Spark workers. Uh, and those, you know, you can scale the number of workers up or down. Uh, Helm has an idea, say, of a Helm chart that will combine the Spark master and the Spark workers into a single chart, a single portable application unit. Uh, and so now we're getting to the point where with Helm charts, you have entire applications that are actually reasonably portable. Uh, so you can have, say, a Helm chart that deploys not just, say, MongoDB or uh, Zookeeper, but you can have a Helm chart that, in theory, could deploy an entire streaming analytics pipeline. So it might include Kafka. It might include uh, a stream processing engine like Spark. Uh, it might include a back-end data store like Cassandra or even HDFS. So we've come a long way. And again, I mentioned before, we have this, this four layer framework we're working on right now. We have the infrastructure, which can either be your on-premise that we already manage with MCP or it could be public cloud. We have the infrastructure resources for your application, which is a lot based on Kubernetes. So that's where the containers of the service comes in, uh, as well as some of the monitoring and operational tooling around that. Then you have the service catalog. And so we're working hard right now on providing a standard service catalog based on Helm. Uh, and the nice thing about that is if you wrap it up in an open, open service broker API, you can make that visible to things that aren't even running inside of Kubernetes. So you get a little bit of a buffer. You could even have, in theory, a VM that's consuming uh, a, a Helm chart to a, a service catalog type of interface. Uh, and then that fourth layer is the application orchestration uh, and optimization. And there, again, we're looking at some even higher level problems to solve, like you know dependencies between different Helm charts, uh, and choosing which type, which cloud you actually deploy onto based on certain policies. And those types of problems are really interesting because they do tend to make you look a little bit broad beyond just the Kubernetes landscape and look at infrastructure monitoring data from your underlying cloud provider, Kubernetes monitoring data, and then workload policies. And so that's a very long introduction to what's on this slide. You know, some of the things that we're looking at to help us address these higher level problems are things like service meshes. So, you know, we think Istio, which is still a very early release, they just released uh, 0 0.22, but it's actually come a long way and it's getting close to being usable for production scenarios. Kubernetes is a service, uh, I'm sorry, Istio is a service mesh. So it lets you help define how a, a set of microservices should work together. And so it solves a lot of different types of problems, but two really interesting problems it solves are routing and load balancing. Uh, so in, in a much more flexible way than Kubernetes does by itself. And you know, the interesting thing now is, is Istio 0.22 can actually include things outside of the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so you're starting to get a little bit, uh, again, uh, your scope is expanding beyond what's in a single Kubernetes cluster. So you can imagine uh, using Istio to define, you know, 20% of your traffic goes to a service running here, 80% goes to a service running there. And that choice can be made based on policies or latency or throughput or underlying capacity, a lot of different factors. But the interesting thing is with Istio, it's, it's decoupled a little bit from just making those choices based on capacity, which you know, Kubernetes is very much uh, designed to let you scale up or down based on things like CPU usage. Uh, so you can say, I want, you know, I want to scale this up to 10 replicas or down to five. Uh, and Kubernetes does have some ability to, you know, do rolling upgrades and things like that. But it's very much tied to kind of how the Kubernetes cluster is working internally, how much capacity it has. Um, and if you're doing rolling upgrades, it's designed to bleed out, you know, just kill all the old re replicas and set in the, uh, bring in a new set of replicas. It doesn't easily let you do things like say, you know, hey, I want 10% of, of my traffic to go to this new service indefinitely until I'm comfortable that it's running. So those types of problems are much easier to solve with a service mesh like Istio. And so you can imagine then taking the next leap and saying, you know what, our choice of how much traffic goes to which site, we actually want to adjust that over time based on, you know, maybe, uh, you know, the underlying bandwidth uh, profile of our network. So some of the things that Amazon does with Route 53 are now becoming a little bit more generally accessible. So we're looking at service meshes pretty heavily right now. Uh, you know, the serverless computing uh, uh, trend with function as a service is really interesting. So we're already starting to bundle Fission uh, for experimental use as a, a function as a service framework that runs inside the Kubernetes. Uh, we think 
this you know function as a service is useful to developers uh, on its own. Uh, it's also somewhat interesting in that it can actually respond to events that are happening in the infrastructure or in the Kubernetes cluster, uh, and so you can actually use it to help you uh, you know run the cluster over time. So that that's a quick recap, really, of you know what we're seeing, what were the trends we're seeing going on in in the you know cloud hybrid workflow uh, hybrid workflow landscape right now, how that led us to decide to invest in providing containers as a service, how our containers as a service offering works, and some of the areas we're looking at in the future, uh, and really you know our focus now is on using our our Mantis cloud platform. To help you with delivery of workloads in in these hybrid and multiple cloud environments, uh, so we're very much focused on workloads because we realize that's actually what keeps the cloud viable in the long run. You know, that's the whole reason for a cloud to exist is to run things on it. So you know, in the in the hybrid cloud scenario, this is what we're focused on. Uh, you know, we have a whole other team that's focused on DNF workloads, which have a much different set of requirements. Uh, but we're really excited about this area, and uh, I. I guess I would just conclude by saying uh, stay tuned and there'll be some very interesting things coming out of uh, Brantis in the next few months. So I think that's uh, the end and we have a few minutes left here for Q&A. Definitely. Okay. So let us move on to questions. Uh, if you have not uh, asked your questions yet, just go ahead and drop them in the question pane. Also, I would like to draw your attention uh, in the uh, in the that same pane on the right hand side, uh, you will see a uh, an entry called handouts. There's a, a, a document there with more information on all of this, so you might find that useful. So uh, please go ahead and grab that document. In the meantime, uh, let's get to some questions. Okay, so Randy, um, what public clouds does MCP support? So the uh, containers of the service that we offer right now supports AWS. Uh, we're looking to add probably both Azure and Google Cloud uh, in the future, but uh, the choice of which one comes first will probably be largely just based on you know the demand that we're seeing from, from our customers. Gotcha, so if, if you want one or the other, let us know uh, and, and uh, that's gonna affect what we do. Okay, uh, how about uh, CNI options? Talk a little bit about what CNI options uh, are available and then what we uh, MCP provides for Kubernetes. Sure, so CNI stands for the, you know, the Container Network Interface and Kubernetes is interesting because it actually has pluggable networking. So it has a well-defined set of expectations for what uh, pod networking should look like. Uh, in how pods should be able to talk to one another and how things from outside the cluster should be able to get in, into that network. But Kubernetes makes you choose which network provider you want. Uh, there's several that are, you know, very good uh, choices. Uh, the two that we've decided to focus on are Calico, which is a pure L3 solution. Works really well for general purpose workloads, uh, very scalable, uh, very simple to use. Um, and then the other one we use is Open Contrail. Now, Open Contrail we picked because we knew there's some workloads, mainly on the NFD side, so the network function virtualization side, that do have more intensive demands. Uh, so those could be more demands in terms of throughput. Uh, and then the other interesting one is if you want to have uh, really deep private network connectivity, so almost uh, if you can imagine a private tenant network that's spanning say a Kubernetes cluster uh, and then an OpenStack cluster, uh, Open Contrail lets you do that very effectively. So we've got some great uh, examples of that. Uh, we actually, I think, had one of our talks at the Boston Summit. Uh, Jacob uh, Pavlik, who's our chief engineer, showed an example of that type of hybrid connectivity. So for, for those special type of use cases, uh, you know, Open Contrail can be a pretty good choice. Uh, we actually supported Open Control 3 for Kubernetes uh, before it was, you know, officially uh, certified. So we've we've done some work to to make that supportable. Uh, Open Control 4 will be much more container friendly. Uh, but for containers as a service, right now we're only offering Calico because we think it suits most of the workloads that people will use. Uh, but for bare metal, we do offer Open Control as well. Now you you said that Calico is pure L3. What does that mean? Yep. <laughs> 
it, it, it's, it's a good question. Essentially what it means is that uh, it's a pure overlay network. Uh, so, you know, Contrail is a little bit different in that Contrail can do uh, L2 networking as well. Um, I probably don't want to dig too deep into the weeds of that. I think I'm going to right. summarize it by just saying that for general purpose workloads where your pods don't have a huge amount of advanced networking needs, uh, Calica is a really good choice. It's simpler and very reliable. Uh, if you have, um, you know, workloads that have some more unusual networking requirements, which is more the NFD side, I think uh, Open Contrail would be something good to look at. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, how do you count the number of licensed nodes when I'm using your MCP container as a service? I mean, you count the number of nodes on AWS in a hybrid. I think they mean, do you count the number of nodes on AWS in a hybrid configuration? Yeah, that's a good question. So with uh, MCP, traditionally, when we're using it to manage uh, private cloud infrastructure, we're counting the number of nodes that are part of the cloud. So for OpenStack, it's uh, basically the number of compute nodes you have and basically the same idea with Kubernetes and bare metal. Uh, obviously, that's not relevant for containers as a service because you could be running it on AWS, so you're running it on public cloud infrastructure. Uh, so what we're actually uh, uh, counting uh, in, in this context are the number of Kubernetes workers that were deploying through the containers of the service system, no matter where they happen to be running. So it's essentially how many how many Kubernetes master and minion nodes have been deployed. Gotcha. Okay. Um, how many clusters can you create? There's no effective limit right now. Uh, so we've made some guesses at how many clusters we think people deploy on average, but in reality, it can vary quite a lot depending on your situation. So for example, if you're using Kubernetes clusters created on demand as part of a Jenkins pipeline to set up Kubernetes clusters for integration testing, you might be creating 20 a day, but they're very short lived. You create them, you run tests for half an hour and you tear them down. Uh, other people may deploy two Kubernetes clusters, but they're running for a year. They're running a production workload. So we didn't actually put a limit in there because uh, we don't. It, we think it's, it could vary so much depending on the situation. Um, there may be some practical limits on the monitoring side. So if you have a you know essential Grafana dashboard and you're collecting Prometheus data from 500 clusters, that could be a little bit of a challenge to make sure that you're presenting that in a way that makes sense. But there's no mechanical limit right now. Okay. Um, now we have a question here. I don't know if you're personally familiar with this, so we may have to we may have to punt and get the answer for this later. But um, uh, we have a question. We can as well use OpenStack Magnum service, which comes with OpenStack Pike. It provides the option of using either Kubernetes, Swarm, or and Prometheus. What are the pros of using MCP uh, CAS over OpenStack Magnum? I have some thoughts. Yeah. On that. That yeah, that's a good question. So if you're just talking about how to create Kubernetes clusters in OpenStack, there's, again, a lot, a lot of ways to do it. Uh, we actually, you know, uh, uh, last year there was actually Murano packages that would deploy Kubernetes. There's Magnum, which is a, an OpenStack service that will deploy container frameworks for you. Um, and I would say that the advantage with a, a more generic containers as a service approach like the one we built is that it's not limited to just OpenStack. So Magnum only works on OpenStack. Uh, and it makes some assumptions about the way Kubernetes should look. And it's also uh, not as easy to upgrade the version of Kubernetes that's supported. So it, from our perspective, I think it's just a little bit too tightly coupled to OpenStack and OpenStack upgrade cycles. Uh, so we wanted to build something that worked you know, equally well on public cloud and wasn't as tightly coupled to the underlying cloud infrastructure. Very nice. Okay. Uh, is CAS included with MCP? Uh, so containers as a service is actually uh, an add-on to our core MCP offering. You know, at the moment, uh, it, it shares some of the underlying uh, tools like drivetrain and stacklight. But, you know, we can imagine a situation where uh, you know, particularly once we finish rounding out some of the newer things we want to provide as part of this framework. We can imagine scenarios where we'll have customers that you know mainly use this on things other than OpenStack, 
And so we did want to at least have the ability to decouple it a little bit from the rest of NCT. Uh, so that's not our deployment model right now, but that is the reason why, from a logical perspective, we're treating it as an add-on and not part of the, uh, the core product. Gotcha. Uh, is monitoring included? Yeah, it, that is in the plans. Uh, for the initial release, uh, we have you know, monitoring as part of every, uh, you know, every cluster, but it's not centralized. So in the next iteration, what we want to do is really tackle that monitoring problem. Yeah, you can think of uh, if you're a central DevOps team and you have a lot of development organizations in your company that are deploying Kubernetes clusters, some of them are used for production workloads. You may actually want to have a way to monitor all those centrally. So that's really the next type of problem we're going to try to solve on the monitoring front. Okay. Let's see here. So if you are going to ask questions, you're going to have to get them in in the next like minute or so because it looks like we have gotten to just about everybody. Let me just kind of look and see if there's any that we missed. Um, yes, the slide deck will uh, will be shared. Um, so I think that that is I think that that is it. I think we have. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or to uh, to elaborate on? Or shall we award people, should we remand the next seven minutes back to people's lives? <laughs> uh, I think we can, we can probably give people seven minutes back. It's, uh, I'm about ready for my cup of coffee number seven. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank uh, our, our presenter today, Randy DeFowl, uh, for joining us. And, uh, of course, our, our wonderful uh, back-end support, Michelle Yakura, with whom we could not possibly do this. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today i know everybody is really busy we're we're all uh just crazy busy so thank you all for joining us and we will see you next time thank you very much <laughs>